Hey, it's summer vacation time at Star Wars 7x7, and in past years, we've done flashback episodes in various themed capacities, and this time, considering that this is the 10th year of the podcast and we are on a long countdown <laughs> to the 10th anniversary, I thought it might be fun to look back at the most popular episodes of all time. So over the next year, we're going to count down from 100 to number one as far as the most downloaded episodes of the podcast and we're going to start with our summer vacation here and do the episodes from 100 to 91. We're continuing on with number 92 in the top 100. This one is episode 1350 from March of 2018. It is another one of our looks in depth into the last Jedi novelization, this time featuring a meeting between Supreme Leader Snoke and General Hux and more with Rey and Luke. So let's get into it. Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7. So today is the next in a series of looks at the last Jedi novelization by Jason Fry. Today we're actually looking at chapters 5 and 6 of the novel which feature the first meeting of Rey and Luke Skywalker and also a scene that we did not get to see in The Last Jedi but we walked in on just as it was ending and that's the conversation between Supreme Leader Snoke and General Hux after the the debacle of Dakar, or at least it seemed like it was a debacle, but naturally it wasn't as we all know because the First Order was able to track the Resistance through hyperspace, and this is a conversation between Snoke and Hux where Snoke is kind of caught on his heels a bit. He has no real feel for the technology situation that the First Order has implemented, and you know, it's kind of interesting because there is a reference to the aliens that are hanging out in Snoke's throne room. And these are the people that helped blaze a trail through the unknown regions, blaze hyperspace trails through the unknown regions specifically. So Snoke is at least aware of the value of technology and the idea that, hey, we need some brilliant minds to figure this stuff out. But he's not necessarily aware of the kinds of things that the First Order is capable of from a technological standpoint. And I guess you can kind of forgive him for that, right? He's supposed to be leading the joint. He's not necessarily supposed to have his fingers in every little experimental technology pie or anything like that. But he does seem a little bit surprised to discover, oh, we can track them through hyperspace. You can do something that no other military commander has ever done, Hux. Really? You? Is kind of the implication. And Hux explains it to Supreme Leader Snoke. And Snoke's reaction is, oh, so this isn't a work of genius. This is a work of brute force. So continuing to lay the smack down on Hux. And Hux is like, hey, brute force, eh, you know, it kind of gets a bad rap sometimes. Sometimes we need brute force to do the work we got to do. We also learn in this scene from Hux a little bit of the drama that's been going on since the destruction of the Hosnian system. Hux tells Snoke that surviving senators have dissolved task forces and are heading back to their own planets to worry about the interplanetary defenses of their own homeworlds. So, yeah, any hope of a new republic massing together or banding together what little remains of it to fight the First Order, that idea is getting quashed rather early on in the novel. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't look good for the Resistance or the New Republic early on. I mean, it was bad enough the Hosnian system got smashed. You thought that maybe there was a little bit of hope even with the destruction of Starkiller Base, even with the escape of the Resistance from the First Order arrival on Dakar, but yeah, I mean, maybe it's a factor of having seen the movie prior to reading the novelization, of course, or listening to the novelization, as I'm doing in this case, but yeah, the the threads of hope and then having hope taken away from you are rather jarring emotionally in the novelization experience. And we also find out that the reason why Hux is walking out as Kylo's walking in is because Hux has just gotten word that the First Order has determined the likely location of where the Resistance jumped to. And so he has asked to be excused so he can go off and coordinate the jump into hyperspace and go arrive dramatically at the location of where the Resistance has thought they have escaped to. 
Anyway, so that's what you need to know about the snuck and hoax scene. Snuck and hoax. <laughs> I can't believe I just did that. Snoke and Hux. That's great. Um, <laughs> but before that, we get the scene with Luke and Ray and Chewie and R2 on Octo. And I have to tell you, there's not a heck of a lot there that's different from the movie. So you find out that Chewie, you know, says, ah, you know, I could go, but there's too much to repair on the Falcon, so I'm not going to go. So obviously he's got more going on in his head about that, I think, and, you know, probably a bit of grief about Han still. So, yeah, he decides not to go up to meet Luke. And R2 actually expresses an interest, but the stairs are just too daunting for him, so he doesn't do it. And so the climb is spent in Ray's head a lot of the time. And it's a neat little reflection on how she arrived at this place and all the things that are occurring to her as she makes this journey up the Jedi steps. And when she gets to Luke, it plays out basically as you saw it in the theater where he takes the lightsaber and then he tosses it over his shoulder. We don't get into Luke's head during this scene. It is all about Ray and her trying to understand what Luke is doing here, but we don't get any depth or insight into Luke. I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing or anything like that. I'm just saying it is what it is. This is all done from Ray's perspective. But as for Chewie, of course, he does eventually get involved and we do get to see the scene where he bursts into Luke's hut, tearing the door off the hinges and yeah, all of that stuff. And again, that also happens very similarly to what happens in the movie, although there's reference to you know, not just him bringing out a laser sword and standing up to the whole First Order, but he also asks her, you know, what do you think a, you know, a few dozen Jedi could do? And she's kind of speechless at that. And again, same reactions as what you saw in the movie. The lone difference is a note that Ray wasn't necessarily going to be the one to make Chewie have to tell Luke what happened to Han, that she was going to be the one to step up and, you know, respect Chewie's grief and not make it so difficult for Chewie in this process. And so she was going to be the one who would tell Luke what happened to Han. But we don't actually get the scene where she says, Han's dead, and then Luke reacts to it or anything like that. That doesn't happen in the novelization either. And at least so far, another thing that hasn't happened in the novelization is a certain waterfowl appearance. I mean, the Porgs have not been mentioned by name. They have been mentioned by, oh, these cute little birds that don't look like they should be able to fly, but they're certainly managing it. And there's a little warbling noise here and there. So you hear a little, you know, but not that classic Porg noise that we've all come to know and love. They, and that's a poor impression of it, but it's enough where I know it's in your head now. <laughs> so yeah, that has not shown up in the audiobook yet either. And I'm very curious to see whether it will at some point in the future. All right, I'm going to take a quick break. And when I come back, we're going to talk about how it is that Kylo Ren survived that shot from Chewie's bowcaster. Stay tuned. Hey, Rebel Rouser. No sponsor on this episode today, so I just have a favor to ask instead. If you haven't done so already, please consider leaving a review for Star Wars 7x7 on your favorite podcast app. Not just a star rating, although I will say we are personally very proud of our near-unanimous five-star rating on iTunes. No, I just mean a thoughtful sentence or two about what you like about the podcast, or how happy you are that it's part of your daily routine. And more reviews means better visibility, which means more people get to share in a daily dose of Star Wars joy, and you want that, don't you? Of course you do. So please leave a review on your favorite podcast app today. I thank you, and the Star Wars 7x7 podcast thanks you. Welcome back. So the scene that we saw in the movie with Snoke and Kylo Ren, that takes place in the novelization as well, and mostly the way that you remember it. But there is some stuff that goes on in Kylo Ren's head that we get to hear about, and the most interesting of those things has to do with the fact that 
the shot that Kylo Ren took in the side from Chewie's bowcaster, we find out that if Kylo Ren had not instinctively contained the blaster bolt's energy with the force, that it might well have killed him. So we saw him obviously contain the energy of a blaster bolt very early on in The Force Awakens when Poe was shooting at him. So he came to help him this way as well. I thought that was a rather interesting thing. And... As opposed to what we saw in the movie between Snoke and Kylo Ren, in the novelization, Kylo Ren is, you know, bowing in, in subjugation to Supreme Leader Snoke, and Snoke comes over to him and actually touches him, like, caresses the scar across his face. So there's this creepy little, like, like, idea of his finger going down the scar, and the Novel says that there's a trace of moisture left behind. So what is up with Snoke's weird, you know, wet finger that he's tracing along Kylo Ren's scar? That was a little unusual to say the least, but a very interesting detail and a different way of playing the scene in the novelization versus in the movie. I'd be curious to know what you think. Would you have rather seen Snoke get up and touch Kylo Ren's scar or were you happy with the way that it played out on screen? Let me know. In the comments of the blog post for this show's episode at SW7x7.com. And that is going to do it for the podcast today, my friends. Thank you so much for listening, as always. And may the Force be with you wherever in the world you may be. 7x7 is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars-related items, are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited, other respective trademark and copyright holders. May the Force be with them. All original content is copyrighted by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.